We're going to continue in the early pregnancy complications section by discussing the manifestations, diagnosis, and management of abortion. So let's see how this might manifest on a step two exam. We have a woman who says she's 15 weeks pregnant who presents the emergency department with bleeding and abdominal pain. Her vital signs are stable and on pelvic exam, we see blood in the vault and an ultrasound which shows intrauterine bleeding, products of conception, and a dilated cervix. We're asked what the most likely diagnosis is, and we're given all the different subclassifications of abortion. This is a simple definitional thing, and based on her clinical presentation, exam, and ultrasound findings, we diagnose her with an inevitable abortion. We're going to review all the different definitions in this section and understand why this is the most correct answer. So let's start off with a simple definition. Abortion is defined as pregnancy termination at less than 20 weeks gestation or with a fetus born less than 500 grams. About 80% of spontaneous abortions are going to occur before 12 weeks gestation. Now, as always, there's a physiologic connection here. The majority of spontaneous abortions before 12 weeks are due to chromosomal abnormalities that are not compatible with life. Those that occur in the second trimester are more likely due to maternal diseases. This is a really significant distinction as it impacts the treatment of future pregnancies. There are several maternal factors that can increase the risk for abortion. The first and most important is advancing maternal age, which increases the risk of chromosomal abnormalities. Next is anatomic abnormalities, and we have several examples. The first is uterine anomalies, such as uterine didelphus, seen here. Another maternal risk factor, which results in anatomic abnormalities, includes exposure to diethylstilbestrol, which results in a T-shaped uterus seen on hysterosalpingogram here. We see normal fill and spill of the fallopian tubes bilaterally indicated by the arrows. Another anatomic cause of spontaneous abortion is intrauterine adhesions. On this hysterosalpingogram, we see the dye injector, the cervix, the uterus with adhesions inside, the right tube, and the left tube, with filling and spilling of the dye into the pelvis on either side. Another name for intrauterine adhesions is Asherman syndrome. And you may know that Asherman syndrome is a, a possible result of a vigorous dilation and sharp curatage. There are several maternal factors that can increase the risk for abortion. The first and most important is advancing maternal age. In addition to the anatomic abnormalities discussed, there are other maternal risk factors which increase the risk of abortion. The infectious risks include HIV, syphilis, chlamydia trachomatis, and listeria monocytogenes, all of which have been associated with spontaneous abortion. There's also a possible role for mycoplasma hominis and urea plasma ureolyticum. There are immunologic factors, endocrine factors such as uncontrolled thyroid disease resulting from thyroid autoantibodies or uncontrolled diabetes, as well as malnutrition and trauma. The signs and symptoms seen with presentation of abortion should seem pretty familiar after our discussion about ectopic pregnancy, which is why that workup is so important. The signs and symptoms include cramping, abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, and potential vital sign changes such as hypotension and tachycardia, depending on the amount of blood loss. The workup for a suspected abortion on the Step 2 exam is going to include a CBC, which is going to evaluate blood loss and the need for a transfusion. We may also get a differential in order to assess for potential infection. We'll get a blood type and RH screen, should blood be needed to be transfused, and also to evaluate for the need for ROGAM in the event that the mother is RH negative. We're going to get a pelvic ultrasound to help distinguish between the different types of abortion. It's important to remember you can't answer the most likely diagnosis question about abortion without an ultrasound. Next, we're going to review the different types of abortions. Now, there's a lot of information here and a number of different definitions. Unfortunately, these are simply going to have to be memorized for the Step 2 exam. The reason that it's important to memorize them and be able to recognize their clinical presentation and physical exam and ultrasound findings 
is that each of them have different management options. So in order to answer that step two question, when it asks, what is the next best step in management, we have to be able to know the diagnosis first. So let's start off with a complete abortion. With a complete abortion, there are no products of conception left behind. And we simply follow these folks up in the office to ensure that their symptoms resolve. Next, we have an incomplete abortion. With the incomplete abortion, there are some products of conception which are left behind. We offer them either surgical management with a dilation and curatage or medical management in order to expel the products of conception. Next is the inevitable abortion. With the inevitable abortion, products of conception are intact, but there is intrauterine bleeding present and the cervix is dilated. In this case, again, we have the option of surgical management with a dilation and curatage or medical management to clear out the uterus. Next, we have the threatened abortion. This presents as products of conception which are intact with intrauterine bleeding present, but no dilation of the cervix. In this case, there's, the option is kind of watchful waiting. We do bed rest or pelvic rest and wait and see whether this will continue to evolve and actually become one of the other types of abortion or will resolve and turn out to be a normal pregnancy. Next, we have the missed abortion. The missed abortion presents as death of the fetus, but all products of conception are present in the uterus and are intact. In this case, we have the option of, again, of surgical management with a DNC or medical management. Finally, we have the septic abortion. In this case, there's an infection in the uterus and the surrounding areas. Management in this case typically will involve a DNC and IV antibiotics, such as levofloxacin, and metronidazole. Again, there's an awful lot of information here, but this is a very high yield slide for the step two exam. As a reminder of a commonly tested topic on the step two exam, anytime you have a mom who comes in who is RH negative and presents with first trimester bleeding, they should receive anti-DRH immunoglobulin. The medication needs to be given within 72 hours of onset of bleeding to be most effective. Okay, we're going to move on now and talk about multiple gestations. Multiple gestations are becoming increasingly more common and can be an easily tested topic on the Step 2 exam. Some signs and symptoms of multiple gestations include exponential growth of the uterus, rapid weight gain by the mother, an elevated beta HCG, and maternal serum alpha fetoprotein. Due to the use of fertility drugs, the multiple gestation rate is on the rise and is currently about 3%. Ultimately, multiple gestations are diagnosed via ultrasound. There are two types which are important to remember for the Step 2 exam. Monozygotic twins, which result from one egg and one sperm that splits. These are identical twins. They're the same gender, they have the same physical characteristics, same blood type, with different fingerprints. As opposed to dizygotic twins, which result from two eggs and two sperm. These are also called fraternal twins. They have different or same sex, and they resemble each other. Now the rates of monozygotic twins are fairly constant throughout the world. The rates of dizygotic twins increase with maternal age and parity, and are higher among mothers with families who also have twins. All right, so briefly, to drive home this very important point, we have sperm, we have eggs, and we see that identical or monozygotic twins result from one sperm and one egg, which splits, whereas fraternal or dizygotic twins results from two sperm and two eggs. So again, multiple gestations are going to ultimately be diagnosed by ultrasound. Now, this ultrasound scan of a twin pregnancy at eight weeks gestation shows an important concept. The triangular peak of chorion extending from the placenta to the intertwin membrane is the lambda sign. This lambda sign is seen in a dichorionic and diamnionic twin pregnancy. The concept of amnionicity and chorionicity is very important for the management of the multiple gestation pregnancy. In monozygotic twins, amnionicity and chorionicity 
are ultimately going to depend on the timing of cleavage, which we'll see here. So we can see if cleavage occurs on days one through three, we end up with a dichorionic, diamniotic twin pregnancy, with each twin having their own amniotic sac and their own placenta. When cleavage occurs on days four through eight, we end up with a monochorionic, diamniotic twin pregnancy, with each twin having their own amnion but sharing a placenta. When cleavage occurs on days 8 through 13, we end up with a monochorionic, monoamniotic twin pregnancy, which occurs in only 1% of monozygotic twins. In this case, the fetuses share both an amnion and a placenta. When cleavage occurs on days 13 through 15, we end up with conjoined twins. Again, they're both in the same sac and share a placenta. All of this is important to know because management and screening is different for higher risk pregnancies. With monochorionic twins, there is a risk for twin-twin transfusion syndrome. This is the development of various vascular anastomoses which cause differential perfusion of one twin over the other, resulting in one twin becoming anemic and potentially developing high drops vitalis, while the other one can experience volume overload. There are a number of complications which can occur with multiple gestations. At times, spontaneous abortion can occur in one of the fetus while the other continues to live. When compared to singleton pregnancies, preterm delivery occurs quite often. With singletons, the average delivery is at 40 weeks gestation. With twins, the average delivery is 37 weeks, with triplets, 33 weeks, and with quadruplets, 29 weeks. Placenta previa is significantly more common with multiple gestations. And anemia, given the increased need for iron given to fetuses. Other common complications include intrauterine growth restriction, preeclampsia, which is three times more likely with twins, postpartum hemorrhage, which we'll discuss later, and placental abruption.